Right, welcome back in. We're just going to pause the news breaking all over the place seemingly every day because Late Kick is back on the air. Welcome in. It is now, yes, August, August 2nd, the year of our Lord, 2020, a jam-packed show. As always tonight, we sincerely thank you for tuning in or listening on the podcast. Five-star reviews on the podcast side, subscriptions on both sides, especially on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel because the more things get closer to actually happening, and by things I mean, I don't know, a football game or two eventually happening, the more content we're going to have here, and it's all free. So we only ask that you subscribe. We really thank you for being with us tonight. On tonight's show, we've spoken at length about the biggest storyline to us in college football, which is the talent drain that's going on in Florida. Well, maybe, just maybe, there's one major in-state program that's getting set to sort of cut off the drain, cut off that spigot a little bit and keep some of that in-state talent at home. We will discuss. I'm also going to revisit, now that we've had a few days, to stew on it a little bit, our 24-7 Sports Top 50 Players in College Football list. Uh, this did bonkers numbers, by the way. I would imagine we're probably going to put even more emphasis on it this time next year. Uh, as usual, if you have a Top 50 list, you're going to have some takeaways. So uh, they had pretty much every one of us talk about who we thought was too high, who was too low, who got snubbed, and I got qualifications for all three tonight. We had an email that asked, I think, a question that many have asked, uh, not so much speculative, but maybe more out of hope, and that is, hey, with Nick Saban being his age and some of the coaches that he competes against being their age, how much longer is Nick Saban going to keep this up? Uh, this one's really easy, but then I think if you go in depth a little bit further, I think a lot more people grasp and sort of pick up what you're putting down when it comes to Alabama and Nick Saban. It, it very well could be that 50 years from now, when you're telling the story of Alabama football, it could be that there are like two or three more incredible chapters in the Nick Saban era that we haven't even gotten to yet. Can't know that at ground level, obviously. You need the benefit of hindsight. We'll do all that, and then we'll talk about bowl games, like Colin and I were in the break room before the show. Specifically, how are we going to have them? How are you going to determine who goes to bowl games? How many wins do you have to have? Is is, is someone going to be three and seven and go to a bowl game? Someone going to be four and six out there and go to a bowl game? Answer. Probably. Let's get into it tonight, shall we? Is Miami coming? Is that, is that hurricane momentum that I actually feel? Now, again, as I said on the beginning of the show, a lot of, a lot of this program over the past couple of months when we've talked recruiting has obviously centered on Alabama or Clemson or Ohio State. And a lot of it has also had to do, coincidentally, with those teams going into Florida and taking elite players, which has led me to say that one of the biggest things to watch in this sport is if Florida State, Florida, or Miami, one of them gets their act together and ends up keeping that in-state talent at home. Not every one of them, but who down there capitalizes? Because it's wide open right now. It's there. The, the talent is there for the taking. And so there's an undercurrent with every program. Miami's no different. There's an undercurrent that you cannot see at 50,000 feet. You cannot just crack open a preview magazine. You can't just watch SportsCenter and know college football at the nuanced, granular level. You gotta be in touch with the undercurrent. This is the blog culture. Uh, this is the donor culture. This is the message board culture. You can make fun of it if you want to, but a lot of times the information's there 48, 72 hours before it's national. So with Miami, the reason I say all that is there is an undercurrent around this program. There has been for, I would say, over a year now, but more specifically, about the last month or so, there's been this quiet undercurrent groundswell. You, you haven't felt it if you live in Kentucky. You haven't felt it in Nebraska regarding Miami. But if you're close to the program, you've felt it. So if you're in touch with that, you can already be ahead of the curve. Where is it coming from, though? Well, let me take you back to last year. This is the reason I said in some ways it's over a year old. I remember when Manny Diaz got hired there, uh, did a lot regarding Miami on our show at the time it was independent, but I also talked to a lot of people at Miami, and everyone there was very excited because they felt kind of like Louisiana folks feel about Ed Orgeron. They felt like one of theirs was home, and they felt like they had a guy who understood what it takes to win at Miami, and maybe the blueprint there and the, the formula there, maybe it's a little bit different than what it takes to win at Michigan State, for example. And so they were very excited, but what happened was the offense was a disaster at times, could never really get quarterback figured out. It was a turnover fest in week zero against Florida. I was there for that game. 
Um, I still think there was like a turnover five minutes ago in that game. And so things kind of went off the rails. And as a result, a lot of the national attention waned. And of course, the locals weren't happy with the subpar record, but it was what it was. Well, then you get into the offseason, and a lot of people with proper perspective in Miami circles understand, okay, it didn't happen year one. But the best don't always click in year one. Nick Saban was barely above 500 in year one at Alabama, and he may be the greatest to ever do it. So big deal. Manny Diaz didn't go to the ACC championship game in year one. Don't worry. We still got the right guy. But you need validation. And here's what the validation is. He makes a move just like that. He sees that something needs to change offensively, goes and gets Rhett Lashley. Not only that, they see that quarterback's a mess, they go get this young man that Colin's showing you right now if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're not, we're showing you De'Eric King, who was a star quarterback already at Houston and is going to come in and instantly turn them into a contender, instantly make them capable of winning any game they play. And I do mean any game they play, even ones they may be double-digit underdogs in, thinking of one on the road in the state of South Carolina specifically this year, because they have that dynamic talent at quarterback. Now, they got some holes still to fill on the roster, but the point is those were two things immediately that that coaching staff led by Manny Diaz addressed that made people salivate at the thought of the fact that maybe we do have the right guy here, took decisive action. Well, here's the third component, and here's the one that I'm paying attention to the most right now, recruiting. That's what it all circles back to. When James Williams surprised a lot of people, yours truly included, by just choosing Miami sort of out of the blue, not that the Canes weren't in it, but it looked like he was going to take his recruitment all the way to signing day. A lot of us thought Georgia led for him. I will tell you readily, I thought Georgia led for him. And all of a sudden, he commits to Miami and commits to Miami and makes it a point to say, I'm not leaving the state of Florida, makes it a point to say it's about family, it's about brotherhood. You know the old talking points down there that when Miami's right are more than just talking points. He dropped all those on you, didn't he? And then the attention turned to a couple of other places. We got James Williams. He's staying home, five-star athlete. What about Jason Marshall? What's he going to do? TBD on that one. It looks like an Alabama-Miami battle there. But the next one you look towards is you look towards Leonard Taylor, who's a five-star defensive tackle from Miami. They grow on trees, literally, down there. And you ask yourself, where is he going to go? Released a top two a couple of weeks back of Florida and Miami. I would lean heavily towards the Hurricanes right now. And then all of a sudden, if that happens, and he's got a commitment date, um, it's early August. You guys know when it is. It's early August. I should know when it is. August 6th. That's my dad's birthday. That's when it is. So uh, early happy birthday to Dan Pate. And also possibly happy birthday to Miami. It's not even their birthday. They may just get another huge piece to the future puzzle. And then you're going to hit refresh on those 24-7 sports team recruiting rankings and you know who you're going to see in the top 10 all of a sudden? You're going to see Miami. You're going to see the Hurricanes in the top 10. So then I want to take those three components, and that'll, listen, they will be bathing in the Kool-Aid already in Miami circles if those things continue to happen at the rate they are. But then you have what figures to be one of the most unpredictable and chaotic seasons in the history of college football coming this season. Somebody is going to shock the world this year. Somebody is going to, by virtue of all the insanity, be that program or be one of those programs that put it together and capitalize on the chaos and surprise everyone. Miami's already done it a couple of times on the recruiting trail. I'm just throwing this big fat what if out there. What if the changes at offensive coordinator and the insertion of a dynamic threat at quarterback in Derek King all of a sudden make them a contender, and they start winning some of those 50-50 games. And they go into places like Clemson, for example, where they're a double-digit underdog. And even if they don't win, what if they push Clemson to the wire? Of course, an upset would turn the entire conference upside down. But what if Miami is the team this year? On top of all the other stuff, on top of the recruiting momentum, on top of the program momentum, what if it's validated on the football field, not in 2022 or 23? What if it happens in 2020? Wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world to me. Uh, they certainly are not void of adequate talent to get it done. I didn't think they were totally void of it last year. But you got it figured out at quarterback, which we think they do. You got it figured out far more than, by default, a lot of people do in this sport. So got two eyes, keeping both of them on Miami right now. Miami momentum. Alliteration is important.
Alliteration is important. All right, the top 50. We released this last week on 247sports.com, and this was essentially where a lot of us at the national level were asked to rank the top 50 players in college football. Now, I don't ever claim to be a talent scout. However, I looked at our finished product, and I thought it largely stood up against criticism, but then again, I had some criticism for it because, naturally, all my guys didn't get placed where I wanted all my guys to get placed. Um, everyone that I'm going to list here, we're going to talk about a few of these guys. Everyone I'm going to list here, I don't have a huge bone to pick. I just want to go down the list and a few things that stand out to me, a few names that stand out to me, why they stand out to me. And you can find the list yourself at 247sports.com and you can let me know what you think about it in the comments section, who should have been there, who is there that shouldn't have been there, and who should have been higher, should have been lower, because those were the questions that we were asked to answer after we turned in our submissions. So Trey Lance is one of the first names that I want to get to. Trey Lance is already projected to be a first-round draft pick in the upcoming NFL draft. He is the quarterback at North Dakota State. Now, the reason I'm mentioning Trey Lance is not so much because I question his being in this list. He's the guy that you don't have any certainty about this year as it relates to schedule. It looks like everyone else is coming out. And every, everyone else at the Power 5 level is talking about what they plan to do. Now, whether it ends up coming to fruition is largely up to fate at this point. But this is an FCS program, North Dakota State. Now, they're a powerhouse, but they're an FCS program. So the biggest question with Trey Lance, and I got it for the Late Kick Extra podcast the other day, uh, which is available for download right now, five-star reviews appreciated. One of the questions someone asked me about Trey Lance that kind of made me think for a second, which is always good, is um, what happens if the FCS doesn't have a season this year or the conference that North Dakota State's in doesn't have a season this year? What does he do? And the question was like, does he transfer somewhere and try and get eligibility to play his senior year? Now, to me, the quick answer was no. Remember what I said about him. I didn't say he's a guy with first-round potential. He has that. But I said he's a guy that a lot of mock drafts and a lot of anonymous executives at the NFL level already have projected as a first-round guy. So if you're sitting there telling me that if the draft were today, I would go first round and then I don't have a season, I'm just going to train for the draft. I'm not going somewhere trying to learn a new offense over the next 10 or 15 minutes, uh, risking injury and doing it when I don't have to do it, I guess, would be the best way to say that. So Trey Lance at number 10, interesting. And a, a side argument there, a nice side debate is – the three, it looks like the three premier quarterbacks in the upcoming draft. You got Fields at Ohio State, you got Lawrence at Clemson, and then you got Lance at North Dakota State. And the big question is could he actually be taken before one of the two big boy power fives? He's a big boy in his own right, but you understand where that debate comes from. Now let's go the power five route. Let's go to the SEC. Jalen Waddle at Alabama was listed at number 13. And so I was thinking about a nice prop bet. A couple of prop bets I think would be good with Jalen Waddle. Prop bets are just random stuff that odds makers sometimes put out that you can bet on that doesn't include the side or the total. So Jalen Waddle, I think it would be a very interesting prop bet to see what kind of odds I could get betting that he would have a rushing touchdown, a passing touchdown, a return touchdown, and a receiving touchdown this year. So four different ways. Because I think he'll have all of those, or I think there's a very good chance he could have all those. And I would love to see what I can get there. I'd also love to see what the over-under uh, rushing attempts for Jalen Waddle this year would be. A lot of direct snap potential for Jalen Waddle. He's just a dynamic guy. He is a healthy version, I think they were the same number if I'm not mistaken, of Kenyon Drake. Like when Kenyon Drake was at Alabama, when he was healthy, I always watched my TV or in person when I was there, and I said, why don't they give Kenyon Drake the ball more? Like, do, do, am I the only one that sees how nervous that defense is when he's on the field? Am I the only one that sees the pressure he puts on them? Well, it's to another degree with Jalen Waddle. So this is the guy. Remember, we were talking about this a couple of months ago. I'm not big into Heisman talk, but if you told me that I had to take a non-quarterback as my pick to win the Heisman, that'd be him. Jalen Waddle is my leader in the clubhouse as a non-quarterback Heisman candidate this year. Let's move on. Now, this is the one I had the biggest beef with. Number 35 was Iowa State quarterback Brock Purdy. As many of you who watch and listen to the program regularly know, I can't explain it, but I've kind of adopted Iowa State 
as one of my surrogate programs that I pull for. I guess you could call it bias. So I have some Iowa State bias, but there you go. I admitted it. So that means I'm immune from criticism. I think that's what the rules say. Brock Purdy's at number 35. Quite simply, there are not 34 college football players that I would take if I had my own program to run before I would take Brock Purdy. He has, at this point, significant experience in big games. He just has the experience factor, period. He's got very good mobility. He has, in other words, the tools that it takes to win the way modern-day offenses ask a quarterback to win. Very good ability to improvise. Very good ability to make plays when your initial play breaks down. Very high football IQ. Very good leadership qualities. And I go back to that E word again, just for good measure, experience. Especially paramount in a season like this where you lost a lot of what you would have in spring and maybe you reside in a conference where some of the bigger contenders are trying to break in a new quarterback. Oh, you. So um, Brock Purdy at number 35, I thought should be higher. Another guy I thought should have been ranked at the very least was Eric Stokes at Georgia. Now, we didn't even have him ranked. Eric Stokes, he's a defensive guy. Maybe some of you don't know who he is. He is uh, the best corner that Georgia has. He has been inked in, not penciled in. He has had his name written in ink as a starter at corner for two years at Georgia. Now, I'll tell you why that's pretty significant. Some of the most heated position competition at any program in America over the last couple of years, this one included, has been the corner position at Georgia. And even having said that, this is one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in the country. That guy has, without question, been the alpha corner on that team. He's a guy that's not afraid to be physical at the line of scrimmage. He's everything that Kirby Smart wants in a corner. He is probably going to end up being a first-round guy in the upcoming NFL draft. Uh, He is a fixture on defense for probably the best defense in the country this year. So I just go back to, I'm I'm not lobbying for him to be top 10, but I don't know how in the world we have 49 or 50 guys listed above him. And then there's another one that I understand more. Another question that we were asked, Uh, that I would encourage you to ask yourself as well is, which guys aren't listed here that will be top 50 by the end of the year? And I went to Christian Barmore. Christian Barmore is a name most of you don't know. Christian Barmore is a former elite recruit out of the Philadelphia area, I want to say. He goes to Alabama. Um, Last year, there were times where they put him on the field. And every time they put him on the field, he flashed. You look at the pro football focus advanced metrics, and he's right at the top of some of the advanced metrics that they keep, but you just didn't see him a whole lot. But when he was on the field, very disruptive. Now, I'm not questioning Nick Saban's personnel decisions. There's always a reason why a guy's getting the amount of playing time that he's getting, and we're nowhere near qualified to know, even if we know everything about football. There's stuff behind the scenes. Who knows? I don't know anything about Barrymore behind the scenes. What I'm telling you is this reeks of Quinn and Williams. Quinn and Williams had the same kind of career arc to where – He got on the field, and when he was on the field, everyone's excited. Everyone's leaned forward in their chairs because it always seems he makes big plays. It always seems like he's right there around the football when he's on the field. He just wasn't on the field a whole lot. Then he was pretty much an every-down player and was a top-10 NFL draft pick. But you really only saw him used to that degree for one year. I think that's what's about to happen to Barmore. I think they're going to heavily incorporate him in this year's defense, and I think he's going to have a Quinn and Williams type year. And then I think there is a very good chance that he, at the end of the year, if we do this list again, Christian Barmore could be a top 10 player after having not been ranked. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't be shocked if we said that about Eric Stokes too. So those were uh, my reactions to our top 50. You can let me know what you think about that. Uh, let's circle back around since I, I wanted to caboose it there with an Alabama player because we, um, we like to transition in this business sometimes. And this seamless transition goes into the question that we had from Jeff in the inbox. It was for the Late Kick Extra podcast, but as you know, sometimes I select some of those questions to use on uh, the regular Late Kick Live, which you're watching right now. And he asked this. He said, why do all these kids commit to Alabama knowing Nick Saban's about to retire? Well, my simple answer is, I don't think he's anywhere close to retirement. Now, that's my simple answer. Obviously, they don't think so ever, or either. Here's what I think a lot of folks are guilty of. Jeff, maybe you included, brother. A lot of folks apply convention to very unconventional situations. Nick Saban is not conventional. Nick Saban is however old he is, 68, 67 years old, however old he is. I know his birthday's on Halloween, I think. 
I told the story one time. I don't know if it was on this show, but I told the story on the podcast one time just to show you how unconventional he is if you're not already sold on it. There was a grad assistant that I knew that was working at Alabama. Now, this kid's in his early 20s. Uh, this was recently. It was fairly recently. So Saban's in his like mid-60s at that point. And he said, you know, the one thing that's going to separate me is I'm going to be able to get to the building every day before he gets there, and I'm going to leave after him. So he's going to notice that, and that's how I'm going to get ahead. Oh, it sounds like a foolproof plan, by the way. And I said, more power to you. Good for you, man. Two weeks. I kid you not. Two weeks go by. And it was like he went on a diet that he couldn't sustain. He said, I can't do this anymore. I couldn't make it, man. He said, I made it about four or five days. And at that point, I couldn't, I couldn't keep those hours. This is a grad assistant. He's not tasked with doing everything Saban does. He said, um, getting there that early and staying there that late, even if I was a zombie from like the hours of 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., just sitting at my desk drooling on my shirt, I still couldn't do it. So this man's doing it and operating at a machine-like capacity all day. It's not conventional. So don't apply the typical late 60-year-old convention to Nick Saban. He's not really a human in that sense. He's more a machine in that sense. But aside from that, I just ask, what's the argument? Like if you, it's one thing if you want Alabama to fade away. I'm not asking that, okay? If you're not a Bama fan, of course you're rooting for that. But I'm asking, if you truly believe that that's happening or about to happen, what evidence are you looking at? And so I asked that to Jeff, and I asked that to a lot of other people who ask variations of this question. And here's what I get. What I get is, well, they're fading. They haven't been as good lately. What are we talking about? Last year, you're talking about last year where they lost a the quarterback, and uh, but really defensive and offensive quarterbacks, if you count Dylan Moses, and they went to uh, the Verbo Citrus Bowl, which was the first time I learned what Verbo was. So I guess that's why you buy naming rights to a bowl game. Oh, is that that's the fade? Is that the fade? I don't think that's the fade, guys, but I guess by their standards it is. And then the other thing is just they go to his age, and I think I just knocked that down like a pinata. He's 68 years old right now. I should have looked at my notes. I wrote his age down in my own notes. And that's only relevant if he is showing age. He's 68, and he outworks people who are 48. So what if the 68-year-olds run in circles around the 48-year-olds? Do you really care about the age all that much? I don't. I don't think a lot of these kids that commit to Alabama that you're talking about really care either. Consider what we have going on up there right now. What we've seen as of late, and this, even if you were on the fence, which I'm not suggesting he has been, but even if you were on the fence, you talk about wanting to be reinvigorated. The overhaul they've had in their sports science and strength and conditioning department, to be honest with you, has been unlike anything I've ever seen. You don't normally hear this much noise about sports science and strength and conditioning. Everyone I talk to at Alabama, raves about this stuff. I can't even get returns on players because all they want to talk about is, guess what this dude David Ballou is doing? Guess what this Dr. Matt Ray is doing up here? And so I listen. A lot of it goes over my head because a sports scientist, I am not. Sounds good. Sounds impressive. But they have unveiled a new sports science center there. They've got what they think is the best sports and strength and conditioning duo in the country in there. Um, so you've overhauled your strength and conditioning. You just signed the number one quarterback in America in Bryce Young. You signed probably one of, if not the most impressive, edge rushing classes that I've ever seen in that same recruiting cycle last year. Their current class, they are loading up on wide receivers again. They may sign the best offensive line class that you've ever seen, if not the best, easily one of the very best. And so I'm trying to look for signs because I want to see them. Trust me. I don't want to be made a fool of. I want to see them if you've got them. I just don't think you have them. I think a lot of people have fatigue, which is natural. I think a lot of people want to see it happen, which is natural. But there is a big difference between wants and beliefs. And I don't know how any rational person can look at Alabama right now and believe that they're going to be anything other than a contender for the next several years. Um, so what I'm saying is, if this company will just put four or five stars next to my name, they'll offer me, and I'll commit tomorrow. You don't want to go there, I'll go there. Last up, and we'll get out of here. Uh, Stephanie was asking a very good question. Stephanie asked in the inbox earlier today, hey, I'm thinking about the end of the season, while everyone's focused on the beginning of the season, exactly what qualifications are they going to use to decide bowl matchups? Stephanie, do you hear those crickets? Those crickets are the only ones here that want to answer you right now. Because I certainly don't know, and they certainly don't know. They in all caps, of course. 
the normal standard is six wins, which we know. And then we have to bend that sometimes because we don't have enough six win teams that qualify. So if you make good grades, you can be five and seven, that whole deal, that whole deal. I don't know if it has been widely reported. I've seen it somewhere. Um, but if you don't know already, we're going to have a record number of bowls this year if every bowl game is played. I think we got 42 or 43 of them. You do the math on how many teams that you need to fill those spots. We are not going to have 12-game schedules, obviously. And so do you keep the six-win qualification? Well, the answer is, of course not. You couldn't even do that when everyone was playing 12 games. So you certainly can't now. So the first thing you have to do, and the reason why no one has even broached this topic yet, is number one, you have to see the season get off the ground. And then number two, you have to see the season get played and see most of your teams in conferences get to the actual finish line. Then, you know, if, it, if we get to November and it looks like things are going fairly smoothly, then we can start talking about bowl games. But when is everyone's conference title game going to be played? When do we start the bowls? Do all the tie-ins still exist? Has anyone revoked their sponsorship because COVID has hit them hard in the pocketbook? Don't know all that. Are all of the locations of the bowls able to be traveled to? No one knows that. But even when they do figure out all those questions, someone's going to be four and six and make a bowl game. We're going to have a four-win team out there in a bowl game. And depending on how the season may potentially get truncated, dare I say, we may have a three-win team in a bowl game. Now, here was my preference, and I was telling Colin this before the show. Because most people are going to some form of conference-only scheduling this year, we had to cancel a lot of neutral site games. Uh, Southern Cal, Alabama canceled. Don't know what's going to happen to Auburn, North Carolina. Looks like that's canceled, though. Well, obviously, that's canceled if you're playing conference only. So if those teams aren't in the playoffs, Notre Dame, Wisconsin, you know, if those teams aren't in the playoffs, I wish that a partnership could be worked out with one of these bowl games or a few of these bowl games to where you could take the big-time neutral site games that we lost at the beginning of the year and we could play them as ball games somewhere nice and warm in early January. No one ever listens to me, but I would love to see that nonetheless. Uh, you guys have been really, really great about the five-star reviews on the Late Kick podcast. You've been exceptional about subscribing to the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. If you haven't already, please do so. Uh, we are training headlong into what looks like we could actually have a football season. So we're going to have a whole lot that you won't want to miss here. We don't charge a dime for it. We just humbly ask that you subscribe to those various platforms. And let us know what you think, because as I've always said and will continue to say, you drive the show. You write the show for us. If you don't like it, we're not talking about it. If you do like it, we're talking about it a whole lot. So we will be back here Thursday night, same time, 8 Eastern, 7 Central. Until then, check out the Late Kick Extra podcast. We release a new one of those every Wednesday, not to mention the audio versions of every episode of Late Kick Live. Until then, though, for Director Colin. For Aaron, for Tani, I'm Josh Bate. Have a great, safe week, and God bless.